Hi, we're back. Uh, I'm doing this straight through on uh, a, a Tuesday at the church, and I, I hope that you don't have to do the whole thing uh, in one sitting, but I, I need to get this out ahead of the confirmands because I hear footsteps, and Pentecost is coming, and there's at least one that wants to be confirmed, so we're trying to get the information out. So now we come to the third article of the Creed which says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. So what we have here is the person of the Holy Spirit and um, the business of church, the community of Jesus' followers, that, that, that body of Christ. So, the church is literally the creation of the Holy Spirit. So, you have uh, in the witness that's in the scriptures, the Holy Spirit is um, a presence of God that's talked about. And in the story of salvation, as it works out from creation forward, the Holy Spirit is mentioned in various and sundry places and times and so forth. And it's when you get to the person of Jesus. For example, John the Baptist says, you know, I'm going to baptize you with water as a sign of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. There's one coming after me, namely Jesus, who is going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Baptism is to, it's a laundry term where you take something and you completely submerge it underwater and until it's super saturated and then it's brought out. That's the baptisto. And um, you may remember in the science class somewhere in school where they gave you a chunk of natural sponge. It was really hard and crusty. And if you squeezed it, it crumbled and so forth. But when you took it and put it in water, it took a little while, but it began, the water began to seep into the membranes of the sponge and got softer and it's holding water and so forth. And after a while, you could push it underneath the surface of the water and it would become super saturated so that when you pulled it up, there's water just running out of it and you squeeze it and there's just more. And um, that is to baptize. And up until Jesus, the Holy Spirit was present in creation, and the Holy Spirit was given, for example, when Moses was given the dimensions of the tabernacle uh, in the wilderness, the Holy Spirit was given to a couple of artisans so that they would have the skill to do the work of building the tabernacle. Uh, when Saul was anointed as king, the Holy Spirit fell upon him for a short period of time and he hung out with a group of prophets and had ecstatic utterances and so forth and then the Holy Spirit was taken from him and so the Holy Spirit's present in and out. Uh, in Luke's gospel when you get to the birth of Jesus you have Mary shows up to see Elizabeth and the baby is filled with the Holy Spirit within her, and there's prophecies being pronounced and so forth. So, uh, the statement about the Holy Spirit um, is important for us. After the resurrection, so Jesus was crucified, and we don't know exactly when. Scholars have kind of honed it down to a couple possible dates in the 30s, like 30. Um, AD 30, AD 33, uh, and so forth. So if it's the 33 year when there's Sabbath and the day of preparation for the Passover fell on the same day, happened in that year, uh, it would have been around the 7th of April that Jesus rose from the dead. And um, he made appearances to various and sundry people and told the disciples at the ascension, go back into the city of Jerusalem and stay there until the Holy Spirit is given. And so 10 days later, on the, on the Feast of Pentecost, one of the three pilgrim festivals of Judaism, they're gathered 
in the upper room where they had the Last Supper, and the Holy Spirit fell on them in a palpable way like tongues of fire and landed on each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to prophesy and to speak in tongues and to praise God and so forth, and they literally were driven out into the street and were speaking in languages that they didn't learn in school and to all the various pilgrims that had come from all over the world to celebrate this festival in Jerusalem, proclaiming the good news of what God was doing in Jesus. And it became a mark of Christians, and um, uh, you see it throughout the, the New Testament. Uh, for example, Peter goes up to Caesarea Maritina, preaches the gospel to the Roman centurion Cornelius and his family, his household, and the Holy Spirit falls on them in a Pentecost-like event, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Reception of the gift of the Holy Spirit is what constitutes a person being a Christian, okay? Now, in the Lutheran tradition, um, we associate the gift of the Holy Spirit into a person's life um, with baptism, and so you'll hear that. It's in our hymns, it's in our prayers, and so forth. Um, let's try to bring that reality forward. In the baptismal rite, if your pastor is doing it the old way, you have um, not only the laying on of hands, which is part of the old rite, you have anointing with oil that is a uh, liturgical representation of blessing, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's also an exorcism rite to drive out any uh, spirits of anything that's contrary to what God's doing. And then in the old days, the pastor or whoever was doing the baptism would breathe on the person being baptized and say, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus did that in the Gospel of John on Easter night to all the apostles and the disciples that were gathered in the upper room. He appears in front of them all, and then he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And that's what turns them from Jews who are his disciples into Christians. Okay, the gift and the possession of the Holy Spirit given not only to the whole church, but given to each individual Christian as well. That Holy Spirit, according to the teaching of Paul, will work a transformation uh, from the inside out of the Christian. And Paul refers to this as the fruit of the Spirit. And he lists, uh, in one place he, he says, you know, don't be drunk with wine, where it's in excess and so forth, but be filled and keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit uh, he lists as virtues like love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, and, and so forth. And uh, one commentator pointed out that those are descriptive of the character of Jesus. So we are becoming Christ-like by the cultivation within us, by the Holy Spirit, of this fruit of the relationship with Jesus. Jesus gives gifts to his disciples through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and they are varied. There are at least three places where Paul has what I call a for instance list. He's talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and then he says, like, for example, and he, for instance, he throws out half a dozen uh, Ephesians 4 is one um, place, and he says the Holy Spirit gives these gifts with a purpose, and the purpose is so that uh, each individual Christian who is a member and a vital part of the body of Christ is equipped by the Holy Spirit to have something to contribute to the ongoing life of the church generally and in their particular community so that the mission of carrying the gospel to the world can happen. And so in your faith community, you will discover that there are all kinds of people with all kinds of gifts, and some of them are administrative, some of them are uh, speaking skills like uh, preaching or teaching, uh, some uh, are prayer and hospitality. <clears throat> all of these given 
by the Holy Spirit to create a functioning body of Christ in the world. And so that's captured here in the third article of the Creed. I believe in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the, the fellowship of all of those who have been called by Jesus into this salvific relationship. We don't pick him. It's in St. John's Gospel. He says, you didn't pick me, I picked you. Okay, so you're here on purpose. Um, the Holy Spirit, by working the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, also and begins with the forgiveness of sins. Okay, so um, sin is to miss the mark. It is to not do what the Lord wants done, and it gets a grip on somebody, and you become a slave to it, and the Holy Spirit frees you from that grasp and empowers you to live free as a brother or sister of Jesus of Nazareth. And the sins are forgiven, and when God forgives a sin, the power of it's broken, and you can go forward, no matter how much the world, the flesh, and the devil try to tell you otherwise. Um, another gift of the Holy Spirit that is yet to come is every single one of us who dies in the faith will be, like Jesus, bodily resurrected at the end of time and be on a redeemed, restored earth where God and Jesus make their home in the New Jerusalem on earth with us and begin a whole new chapter of existence um, that is coming, and that's a gift of the Holy Spirit. And uh, nothing's going to be lost. Jesus said, I'm wiping away every tear. He's going to put it all back the way it's supposed to be and launch us into the future without the sin. So that's the promise. So Luther says, what does this statement in the Creed mean? It says, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him, but the Holy Spirit calls me. Okay, that's that, you didn't pick me, I chose you part. Called by the gospel, the good news of God in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Enlightened me with his gifts, okay, there it is. Sanctified, which means to that process of setting me aside for a special purpose, and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth. Everybody. We all are brought in and sustained in the same manner by the Holy Spirit. And keep it in Jesus Christ in the one true faith. One of the things I want to say is Lutherans are sometimes in ecumenical relationships accused of being heretics of the second article of the creed because we focus very heavily on the person of Jesus. And it's really kind of easy because we have four big fat gospels to tell us the life of Jesus that was probably um, nine months to a year. Some people want to say, well, there's three Passovers in John, so it must have been three years. But <coughs> the truth is, Jesus was 33 years old when he started, so there'd been 33 Passovers. But the period of his public ministry, he came on like gangbusters and scared the, the snot out of people like Caiaphas and Pontius Pilate and um, so forth. So I, I'm of the opinion that it was less than a year. Um, but anyway, uh, Luther goes on to say, and this part you'll memorize, in this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, okay, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and to all believers in Christ. People ask these questions all the time. Talk to me about heaven. Heaven is the abode of God where his will is done, the rule and the reign of God. It's uh, when we die, what the scriptures say is that uh, our soul, our essence, will go and be in the presence of the Lord until the day of resurrection, the last day, the day of the Lord. And then we will be re-embodied in a resurrection body like Jesus is for eternity. So heaven, uh, 
uh, N.T. Wright, an uh, Anglican bishop and theologian, said, heaven is really important, but it's not the end of the world. It's kind of a holding place. When Jesus was on the cross, he said to one of the thieves, today you'll be with me in paradise. Paradise was a walled, cultivated garden with water and, and so forth. It was a rest stop for people en route to somewhere else. And so heaven, that place that our soul goes when we dead, is a paradise that we are in the presence of Jesus until the great and terrible day of the Lord, and then we'll be resurrected and go through the judgment and into eternity with him. So that's the creed. Just to sum it up real quick, the roots of the Apostles' Creed go back to the earliest days, and it's associated with a baptismal statement used at the church at Rome where Peter and Paul were executed probably in the year 64. And this uh, document, um, this short saying was associated with baptisms there and over the course of time spread throughout the entire uh, church and is the basic statement of Christian faith. This is what we believe. Now, there are other creeds that we use. One longer one that's very much like this is called the Nicene Creed. Dates from around 325 at the Council of Nicaea in modern-day Turkey. There's another one that's equally old called the Athanasian Creed, uh, which we uh, drag out on Holy Trinity Sunday once a year because it's really long and it's a little testy and people kind of don't like it, but... Um, in the Lutheran Church, we say there's three creeds that we affirm, Apostles, Nicene, Athanasian. So once a year, we drag it out. Uh, Luther recommended that congregations make a, a choice for the routine work. And what we do at St. John's is um, most of the year, most of the time, we use the Apostles' Creed to help confirmation students. Um, and then on festival days, and then, for example, during... Lent and Easter, we use the Nicene Creed and we'll drag the Athanasian Creed out um, uh, on Holy Trinity Sunday, which is the Sunday after Pentecost, so that we can say, <laughs> we dragged it out and made you endure it. So, um, working our way through the small catechism, and we've done the commandments, now we've done the creed, so we know what kind of behavior is expected. We know what we believe. And next time we'll talk about um, how we have a conversation with our Lord. The disciples went to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Uh, John the Baptist taught his disciples, how about you teach us? He goes, okay, pray like this. And he gave us a prayer. And that's what we're going to look at next time. So thanks for joining me. Any questions whatsoever, please call. We'll be more than glad to work them out with you. God bless.